everybody. Um, so it's wonderful, all the conversations that are happening. I wish we could have just spent the whole evening getting to know one another in a really relaxed way. Um, but I'm actually going to encourage you now, please, to just take your seat so that we can get going. And we will do that in a couple of minutes. Back says to me, Sorry? pull it down so it doesn't look like you have a mustache on the camera. Because oh, I, okay. I was. Yeah. But then it doesn't work, does it? Like, yeah. I, I, well. Okay. Testing, testing, testing. Uh, we don't know that she's here, so what I've asked them to do is to. That's what he, I was just telling her. So is that the right way to do it like that? He thinks it could be a little bit slower. Oh yeah? One, two, three. So we thought we would go with Helen. Put the video on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And that's maybe a good way to get people going. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do the video first. So over to you, honey. So do you want me to introduce you? Okay, whilst we're waiting, has anybody lost one lens out of their glass? I think it's reading glasses. A lens? No. Okay. Put it up here for now. Hello, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here on. Uh, unceded Songhees and Lekwungen territory. Uh, my name is Rita Wong. My Cantonese name is Wang Gumyi. And uh, uh, I'll be introducing our guests tonight, or not guests, our, our um, storytellers tonight. Um, so we're going to start with a video. Uh, it's a short poem by Helen Knott. Uh, many of you will know of Helen's work. Uh, she's um, from the Prophet River First Nation and an incredible poet, truth teller, storyteller. Uh, I follow her blog, um, Dancing with Decolonization, Reclaim the Warrior, uh, very carefully. And she's really inspired me over the years to stay involved and to uh, think about my responsibilities as a settler or an unsettler uh, who benefits from the sacrifices of the Peace River uh, from previous dams, the W.A.C. Bennett and the Peace Canyon Dam. So we all owe a huge debt to the peace, and uh, we cannot afford another sacrifice zone. So it's, it's really amazing to be here with all of you tonight. So we'll put the video on by Helen, um, and after that we'll be, we'll be hearing from uh, Ken Boone and Art Napoleon. Oh, and there's one announcement. Um, if you're leaving today not okay. and not coming back it tomorrow, the same way. Uh, please put your tags in the box when you leave, because we can reuse them. <laughs> and if anybody's missing a and lens, to show you, it's here. Place these two in simulated stomach. My name is Helen, and I'm Deniza, and we hail from Prophet River First Nations, living in Fort St. John, BC. And I wrote a poem for Justin Trudeau. Here you go. Hey Justin, there's some words that I've been meaning to get off my chest. I've even traveled twice to Parliament steps. 
I've heard some of your MPs say that this new relationship is based off of give and take, and we can't have everything that we're asking for. We have 500 years of giving behind us. But hold up, let me check, are you good? Or can I get you anything more? Because your cabinet ministers and departments are sitting behind desks and signing off on permits. Well, you're in the public eye paying lip service to indigenous populations. Well, y'all are making decisions that are gonna be impacting the next seven generations. Doing so in spite of section 35 violations, signing off in light of supposed consultation. And now you are the head of the paternalistic patriarchal structures that be, the ones that change their names over time from Indian affairs to indigenous affairs, as if a name change would change the fact that y'all are still operating on the bones of the Indian Act, trying to govern how your Indians act. Or when it comes to Site C, the mega hydro dam that they want to build in this territory, you'd rather we not react, rather we take your silence for fact your approval for law and your blind eyes as reasons for your wrongs. Well, I thought you should know. I'm delivering this poem from within the proposed flood zone. And this land has been my people's home since time immemorial. I don't come from a placeless people. I come from spines that were made sturdy while sleeping on spruce boughs. From legs that grew strong by scaling the sides of these mountains and from arms that were taught to navigate these waters that span out like arteries all across this territory. This land is my ancestors' living memory. But do you even understand this concept? I think that you like to pretend to, especially when you're donning headdresses and sporting indigenous-inspired tattoos, but when we say places have no monetary value, we actually mean it. Take our nose for what they are, because we can't just head south when everything heads south. We are the ones We'll have to stay behind and clean up your mess. Our children, the ones who are gonna have to suffer from your regrets. So if you want real change, you can't give half measures and only kind of oppress, only kind of continue to violate treaties, only kind of continue to colonize. So please don't promise anything if you're not even willing to try. As for me and mine, we're gonna continue to fight. We're gonna continue to rise up like sage smoke carrying valley and prairie prayers, just like we have done for the past 500 years. Because in case you haven't noticed, in spite of everything, we are still here. She amazing or what? Yeah. Um, is Valine Jules in the house? Valine, are you here? Valine? Um, just wondering. Okay, um, we have a treat tonight. We have uh, two amazing uh, men from the piece, uh, Ken Boone um, and Art Napoleon. Art is a former chief of the Soto and a cultural educator, co-host of Moose Meat and Marmalade. Uh, a Korean Deniza musician, and uh, if you Google him, you will find him singing uh, Bob Marley's Redemption Song in Cree. It is really amazing, and I wish we had time to listen to it tonight. Um, and Ken Boone, a uh, farmer and a director of the Peace Valley Environmental Association and president of the Peace Valley Landowner Association, uh, they'll be coming up to uh, share with us some uh, stories about the peace because... Um, what is there is much more precious than what would um, destroy it. And it's really important, I think, that we have a vision of, of what we are honoring and what we are fighting for. So uh, without further ado, please welcome uh, Ken and Art. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, well, here's a clicker. Okay, so um, the history of uh, resistance to Site C over the many years. Um, um, and it's, uh, and I would say that resistance has been quite um, varied from what, what we're doing today, thanks to the, this gathering and, and, of course, more direct and stronger forms of resistance. And um, 
I'll just start off with um, well, the most ex extreme example of resistance to the Site C, um, you know, unfortunately had a tragic ending. There we go. And that was in July of 19, um, or 2015, when the RCMP fatally shot um, James McIntyre dead at a BC Hydro Site C consultation, or open house. Um, he was a 48-year-old resident of Dawson Creek, no, um, no criminal record, no history of violence, um, but apparently he showed up um, at the event with a Guy Fox mask and, uh, and, um, and a knife in his hand. Um, the IO did an investigation of that incident and cleared the RCMP of any wrongdoing. Um, there's people that um, have some real questions about that, but that's as how that is. Um, uh, James, you know, obviously um, felt very strongly about the project. Um, um, none of us actually knew James. He wasn't affiliated with any of our groups. There we go. So, but, you know, for the most part, over the 40 years of Site C um, resistance, it's been very um, um, peaceful and, and respectful. Um, and, and in obviously in the last dozen years with the ramp up of pressure to build Site C, so has resistance to the project ramped up. Um, this picture here on the right, that's um, early days of the Peace Valley Environment Association. There's, um, there's actually, I believe, a couple people in this room that are in that picture. And uh, on the left hand side there, that's Ruth Ann Darnell. Um, um, in the last 40 years, she's either been the president or secretary of, uh, of the Peace Valley Environment Association and, and still going strong. They're picking, uh, picking bottles for a fundraiser. So, uh, um, so in 2006, um, the Paddle for the Peace, um, you know, and it's, a, it's a become an annual ongoing event. Last year we had the 12th annual, and of course we plan this year to have, uh, have uh, the next uh, in line, and, and, um, and it's just a great event that brings a, a lot of uh, support and a lot of chance for supporters to come up to the, to the River Valley and, and enjoy the valley, and, and, uh, and, um, and at the same time, I guess um, we all know there's been a lot of politicians attend that event, and... Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, some of them didn't quite stick to their words that they spoke uh, so eloquently there. 2010, in April, um, Gordon Campbell flew, jetted up into Hudson's Hope with a huge, expensive entourage, uh, very secretly, um, and, uh, and then they bust over to the WAC Bennett Dam to make the big announcement at the time that Site C was going from the environmental assessment, or sorry, from the consultation process to the environmental assessment process. Um, uh, our, our, our group only got word of it through inside intelligence the night before, managed to get um, people on the ground with uh, uh, actually quite an amazing turnout for a protest and then uh, followed them out to the dam site, um, well, until they stopped us. And, and, uh, and um, actually a, a lifetime resident of Hudson's Hope, longtime farmer, rancher, slipped on down through the bush and tried to crash their party. Um, but apparently they, uh, they weren't gonna have any part of that. Um, um, many of you might remember September 2010, Paddle to the Premier, where right here in Vancouver, where um, a, a big gathering and, and uh, um, two big boatloads of people paddled into the harbor here, carried a, a really heavy boat up onto the lawn of the legislature, and, um, and a, a message was delivered to the government at the time. Um, I seem to remember um, the energy critic at the time, John Horgan, speaking very eloquently at that one, too. Um, so, of course, then in 2013-2014, we had the environmental assessment process for the project, and, um, and uh, a lot of ongoing protest activities with that. This one here is... Uh, um, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips and various elders and leaders from the First Nations um, speaking at an event outside of the hearings. And, uh, and of course, we all know now that, um, you know, despite 
the very strong and key recommendations made by the panel, um, um, the government, the BC government and the federal government issued the environmental assessment certificate for the project. Um, um, and that, of course, resulted in, in ourselves, the Landowners Association and the First Nations um, launching their judicial reviews. Uh, um, we launched two and the First Nations launched two and then, of course, our, our appeals that followed after that. Um, but despite that, um, um, Christy Clark in October, or December of that year went ahead and issued a decision, a big announcement that they're proceeding with the project. And uh, so, of course, that resulted in, um, well, a couple years and counting of, of activity on the ground and protest. Um, there's someone there I see in this room getting handcuffed by the RCMP from, uh, from uh, protest, and uh, there was a number of those. So November of 2015, we put up uh, the shacks there for the dam protesters point. So that's actually on Crown land, right over top of the project. Um, but you have to get through friendly private property to get to that. Um, the government kind of harassed us over that one, really wanted to get it out of there, but, um, um, but they never pushed it too far. Um, it might have had something to do with the First Nations, uh, of course, being involved with setting that up there. And so we've, we've managed to hold that ground anyway. And then we get to 2015-16 winter, uh, the occupation of Rocky Mountain Fort. And um, it, it was a grassroots mix of First Nations and landowners and many others. Um, and they became named as the Treaty 8 Stewards of the Land. And uh, they held Rocky Mountain Fort for 62 days. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, of course, we had tremendous support there. There on the left actually was earlier in the fall when um, a commemorative plaque was placed on the site. The governments um, have conveniently not wanted to commemorate that fort. Um, that is actually the site of the oldest Caucasian fur trading post in mainland North America. And of course, it's very unconveniently right in the way of uh, dam projects. But uh, so it was felt that we should commemorate there. Um, I think I see Art Napoleon and, and uh, Bud in that picture there too. And on the right, there's, um, um, you know, we, of course, we had great support in a visit from, there's Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and, and uh, David Suzuki and Yvonne Tuppers in that picture and, and Helen Knott and, and um, yeah, it was just a great day, their visit out there. Um, we flew, we slung in uh, two of those shacks, they're 10 foot by 10 foot shacks. We rigged one up as a cookhouse, one as a, a bunkhouse. Um, and of course, we had uh, other tents there to house people. Hydro really hated to see them things come slinging overhead of their heads and uh, pop down in there, not once, but twice. Um, so, now coming up next is a video here, just watch this. Um, this, this kind of scenario, this happened on a numerous occasions. So there was a momentary where no one was watching the front line. They fired up that machine and tried cutting trees down again. Here I am following an elder. And we walk up. And of course, you've seen the other guy going for the radio. For safety reasons, they have to shut that machine down when you get too close. Um, so there he is. He's shut down. And, uh, you know, we just had to stay after him time after time. but. I think that was about the final resting spot of that machine for about two months. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, uh, spring of 2016, the um, Kirsten Henry hunger strike at the, at the offices of BC Hydro in Vancouver. Um, and, and ended up with a huge camp there, a great awareness um, event and brought a, actually I think that was, I might be wrong, I think that was actually the start of Fight C group, um, who's been very effective and, and um, you know, and, and you, know, I've, you know, due to health problems, of course she had to shut that down, but that was a really um, brave and, and, uh, and 
a, a great awareness arriser. Here's um, the Treaty 8 Justice Caravan um, that went from our place there at Bear Flat to Montreal for the First Nations Federal Court of Appeal case. Um, and, uh, you know, and that was a great event with great support for various groups. I believe Amnesty International was quite involved with that. And, um, and then this next one I'll let Art speak to. Um, that's actually his uh, fish camp. Do you want me to speak now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is, is this mic on? I don't think, or should I be going oh, up there? Oh, not up here. I'm a little bit uh, fighting a cold here, so this is my blues voice. <laughs> yeah, we had this, uh, what we should have done, Ken, if I was thinking, I would have uh, patented the image of those teepees that I set up, because I think they were the most filmed teepees in BC. Don't worry, they're coming up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there were three of them, but the wind blew one down, and if, and if you see the one on the right of the two that were left, it's really, really leaning. It, it was a really rough job because I thought, well, these are youth. They're not going to notice if the tents are a little flappy, you know. But they ended up staying there uh, because people wanted to film them with uh, northern lights uh, in the background and fires lit up inside. So one of our uh, good photographers from up in the piece did, did that. But a lot of tourists, I think, wanted, to, uh, wanted in on the action as well. So this was a camp set up specifically for... Um, youth to get back in touch with the river, to get back in touch uh, with the ways that we use the river, including traditional fishing methods. And it was really, really hard to find any elders left, actually, who knew the old fishing methods. We, we haven't really been using the piece for a lot of years because of the... Uh, people just don't have enough information about the contaminated fish, uh, the contaminated bull trout, so people don't really eat it. They might pop in a, a line, you know, just, just to go and enjoy the day, but people aren't bringing it home and consuming it. And so these kids were out there learning uh, uh, which islands you could find sweet grass, where you could find uh, different berry crops. And uh, they did a little bit of hunting, a little bit of fishing, and uh, a whole lot of bonding. I think Chief Roland stopped by and helped us make a really horrible fish net out of willows. I think the beavers ate it. <laughs> we didn't catch any fish. <laughs> but the cool thing about this camp, it was funded uh, through a program uh, through the University of Alberta. And they liked our final report and um, ended up going to Thailand to meet lots of other uh, people who are around the world who are also trying to protect their watersheds. And I think we'll be going to, to Brazil next all from this tiny little innocent little camp. <laughs> so uh, we thought a lot of the co community members from Treaty 8 would come out and support, but it was Chief Roland that showed up and uh, lots of other people didn't because I think they knew that these are our children of the uh, protesters, <laughs> <laughs> children of the anti site See, By the way, there's a pro site C going on at the Catholic Church next door. <laughs> They're, they're paying honorariums. <laughs> so do we move on to the next? <laughs> the visitors. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, there's a famous cowboy up there who, ri who drives a big boat, and uh, he likes... Zooming by that hydro security. He, he's a bit of a shit disturber. Oh, I can't say shit in church. I'm sorry. <laughs> they allow it at the Catholic Church. <laughs> but in any case, uh, all you have to do is zip by in a boat and that security is on you. Actually, the day we were drumming up on by, by the, uh, the lookout cabin, um, they were zooming below us with their you could tell they had the big scopes out and they, they are, it's just a form of intimidation, it's a form of harassment. And when we went to pick sweet grass on the banks, we went actually to the old Rocky Mountain Fort camp to see what was left, it was already, it had already been mowed down. 
If you go there now, it's mowed down even further. You won't find anything green at all. It's all been completely mowed down. And so all those memories that we made at that camp, because I got to go there and spend about three nights, and it was really, really nice, beautiful, people really bonding and, and doing things together, really pulling together. But in any case, we went to see the old fort site, and we, uh, the hydro boats uh, accosted us and told us that we can't go there. So we went anyway. <laughs> it's kind of weird, you know, because here you are, being confronted by somebody from your own community. This was like a puppet company set up, probably paid very well, hired a lot of outsiders that are not actually from Treaty 8, and there's a handful of community members from my community as I recognize them, and, and he's like, yeah, I can't let you go up there, Art. <laughs> it was like something from a movie, and I had to say, well, you know what, we're going up there. <laughs> You guys can wait here. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're exercising our treaty rights. We're, we'll pick some sweet grass and we'll even show it to you when we come out. So we're not stopping. So we went and, and got to go in there anyway. But this, uh, those were the kind of tactics that were uh, quite normal. And, uh, well, let's move on to another slide here. Ken, how do you operate this thing? You're a white guy. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be the cowboy coach. <laughs> I'll be the talking Indian, all right? <laughs> yeah, moose meat and marmalade. <laughs> that so, should say goons. <laughs> um, all right, are you done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I invited him up here, didn't I? So, um, okay. Where was I? So, more um, protest activity. Um, yellow Stake fundraiser. Um, and so there's Luke Wallace shooting his uh, Yellow Stake fundraiser song on the right there. And that's just been a great um, awareness raiser and fundraiser. Um, about $70,000 worth just so far, and, well, and counting. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, And of course, you guys all know that uh, once again, some politicians uh, had some stakes and they didn't really live up to their words, so they were returned across town this earlier today. But, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, oh, so about a year ago, uh, World Wetlands uh, Day um, event that we held at the Watson Slough uh, wetland, just a little ways up the valley from where we live at Bear Flat. It's uh, like, it's a really critical wetland, very important in the valley. Um, even though it was many, many years in, in advance of hydro needing to clear that if the project was going to continue, they, as an intimidation ploy, I'm sure, had let us all know they were going to clear that last winter. It's about, you know, there's about 600 acres there of just critical wildlife habitat. So we raised a stink about it. The Peace River Regional District got behind us and, um, and BC Hydro backed down. We made them blink and, uh, yes. And so they actually, BC Hydro actually took an ad out in the Alaska Highway. Uh, Watson Slough were listening. So, and then we get to uh, um, this sad, sad picture. Um, um, BC, this, so this fall, of course, we went through the BCUC process, and despite assurances that it was going to be a valid process, and we won that process, um, and proved that Site C was a bad project, we don't need it, and... Um, and of course, uh, Horgan uh, decided to uh, make that announcement he did. And that has led to the need for this situation where West Moberly First Nations and Prophet River First Nation have to now go again to the justice system for, to, seek, uh, to seek justice. And, um, and so, and, I, and I'd like to make note here at this time too, and, and you know, it is so critical for, um, for people to support these actions that are just so important. Yeah, um, for all of us. And so the, you know, the First Nations that are sticking their neck out and, and all the other groups that stick their neck out, they need, they need support. So those that are able to support that, you know, we, um, we, you know, it's very much appreciated. And, and the support has been amazing. And, 
and by no means is this uh, presentation, um, I've purposely not named names of groups and individuals that have fought the fight because it'd take too long and I'd probably forget some names, but um, it's just been an overwhelming um, pulling together of a lot of diverse groups and individuals um, that are in lockstep working on fighting this project. And, uh, and you know, and, and sometimes I, I've been asked actually just the other day, has all this resistance been worth it? Like all that effort and everything going into this? And I would say, well, it has been. And, you know, I think all we have to do is look at the last year. Um, you know, Site C Dam, uh, with the work of a lot of people, actually, especially down here in, in Vancouver and in Vancouver Island, it, this was made a, an election issue this year, and that's what had to happen. And that's probably what resulted in, in the government we have, I would say, with such a close call. And um, so, I mean, we were winning this process. We won the BCUC process, and, and the only thing we didn't win was that final piece where hoarding and made the, the, the wrong call. So, you know, but so our work's not done. I mean, and I would say, you know, in the worst case scenario, even if we don't win this fight, I mean, we can hang our, you know, we, we can be proud of the, of, of the fi fight that we did, but, you know, it is not over, you know, and, and... You know, and I, I just want to emphasize, and, and this has been very apparent over the years, like the sites, or the Peace River Valley um, evidently has nine lives. This, this has been 40 years, and there's people in this room who've been in that fight for 40 years. And, um, and so, you know, what's going to stop this project, I don't think anybody here can say, but I, I would say there's, you know, we have a really good chance one way or another that this project will be killed once and for all. And, and so I want to thank you guys. Um, for all your support that on working to that mission and and I'm looking forward to the rest, especially tomorrow to working day sessions where we can look, explore those possibilities a little better so thank you Thank you, everybody. I've been asked to uh, send a message from Treaty 8 community members. Just a reminder that, you know, there's a five communities, five First Nations that have signed an impact benefits agreement with uh, Hydro. And I know in my own community, it was not based on informed community consent. It was based on an online vote where 83 people voted yes. We have 700 voting members. So the, uh, there's a little bit of separation sometimes between what leaders do and what community members want. I just sometimes wonder if other communities are in the same boat regarding informed community consent. And the, some of the people there t told me to remind you, there's a, there's a clan up there called Magua Clan. There's 70 members. They're all anti-Site C, former chiefs like Stuart Cameron, George Desjardins, Harley Davis. They're all against Site C. I wish Harley was like, anti-Site C when he was a chief though, but uh, <laughs> just to let you know that oh, those five agreements don't represent all of us, okay?